Hello, and welcome to today's ACM Learning Webinar. This webcast is part of ACM's commitment to lifelong learning and serving to over 100,000 computing professionals and students who are ACM members. I am Tufi Saliba, CEO of PrivacyShell.com, which is a startup factory. I'm also chair of the ACM Practitioner Board Conference Committee. My background is mainly in machine learning, decentralized governance, distributed computing, and cryptography. I've authored and co-authored several algorithms, protocols, and patents, including a fully distributed ledgerless and truly decentralized blockchain protocol. You can find out more about it at privacyshell.com. You can find more info on my background in the bio widget on the left of your screen. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with ACM or what it has to offer, ACM offers educational and professional development resources that bolster skills and enhance career opportunities. Our members can stay competitive in the constantly changing world of computing with a range of ACM Learning Center resources at learning.acm.org. You can see some of the highlights on your screen. ACM recognizes the role of computing in driving the innovations that sustain competitiveness in a global environment. ACM provides timely computing information published by ACM, communication of the ACM, and means access to the ACM Digital Library, the world's most comprehensive database of computing literature and international conferences that draw leading experts on a broad spectrum of computing topics, support for education and resource, including curriculum development, teacher training, the ACM Turing, and ACM Prize in Computing Awards. ACM enables its members to solve critical problems using new technology that enriches our lives and advances our society in the digital age. I will also be launching the International Blockchain Conference, among others, later on this year. Okay, so uh, before we get started, I'd like to quickly mention a few housekeeping items shown on this slide in front of you. On the bottom panel, you will find a number of additional widgets and resources. If you are experiencing problems with the slides or audio, refresh or relaunch the presentation. If you have questions during this webinar, please type them into the Q&A box at any time during the webinar and click the Submit button. I'll organize the questions as Mark Muller Eberstein speaks, and he'll reserve time at the end of the presentation to address them. This session is being recorded and will be archived. You will receive an automatic email notification when it becomes available. And check learning.acm.org for updates on this and other upcoming webcasts. At the end of the presentation, you'll see a survey open on your screen. Please take a minute to fill it out to help us improve our webinars. You may also open the survey at any time throughout the presentation from the menu doc at the bottom of your screen. Today's presentation is the next radical internet transformation, how blockchain technology is transforming business, governments, computing, and security models by Mark Muller Eberstein. Mark is CEO and founder at Agtech Corporation in one of the world's leading experts on how businesses can leverage key technology trends, transform organizations, and drive a competitive advantage. He teaches at Rutgers University Business School and is an international renowned business leader, entrepreneur, investor, consultant, and best-selling author. Mark also leads the Innovation Economy Research Institute, works with the Shenzhen China is in Quanhai Institute for Innovation Research, 
I hope I said it right, quite high. <laughs> um, the, A- the Asia Pacific Economic Corporation and delivers guest lectures around the world. His key focus areas are discovering, understanding, and explaining future trends of technology and communication technology and what they mean for business. Mark is now also actively invested into organizations focusing on the Internet of Things, blockchain technology, and crowdfunding. What an amazing mix. Having worked in technology leadership positions at Fortune 500 companies, including HP and Microsoft, Mark has more than 25 years of experience in the information and communication technology industry. He has worked with companies and governments around the world to choose, adopt, roll out, and measure the impact of new technologies to increase productivity, accelerate collaboration, and improve people's lives. Mark, without further ado, take it away. Thank you very much, Tufi. I feel very humbled by your introduction. Uh, Hello from Seattle, Washington to all the participants. It's a real true honor to be here today at the ACM event and share with you some of the thoughts um, that um, over the last years I've been able to learn and uh, discuss with uh, leaders from the APEC organization, finance CEOs, um, IT leaders around the world. And um, one of the things I'm really looking forward to today is um, the Q&A at the end, because I know there are really, really smart people on this call. Um, so I'm looking forward to learn from you as well. Um, we will go across a variety of topics regarding to the blockchain technology um, today. I touched on them. There's some more information in the slides. And the slides will be available for download and, of course, will be available after the session for Q&A, and I'm looking forward to continued discussion on Twitter, on WeChat, um, and of course, um, on all the other media and outlets and here on the ACM side as well. I'm really excited to be here because blockchain technology is one of those topics that is really going to transform the world. As Tufi mentioned earlier, I'm old enough to remember the time when the internet just started. And I remember serious discussions we had then if the internet is only going to change or how is it going to change the postal service, this email thing, is it going to replace or reduce the amount of mail that is going to be be sent? None of us at that time were really thinking about what Amazon would do to shopping, the Netflix uh, doing for entertainment, or how online and mobile banking would transform all of our lives on a day-to-day basis. Looking at blockchain technology, it feels exactly the same or maybe even stronger than then. We are just scratching the surface of what's possible. And I think one of the things that is clear looking at the technology trends and what's happening, that is tomorrow is going to be very, very different. Like with the Internet, it's going to change. The world is going to be changing faster and faster. And um, it is important for all of us individual, but also for our organizations to be agile and uh, adjusting to the change that is happening in the innovation economy as quickly as possible. Collaboration and knowledge sharing, like events today, are critical for all of us to stay on top of what's happening and exchange and build this new world together. Because we are for very clearly at the beginning or at the next big revolution, we can call it the fourth revolution, some people call it the fourth revolution, they call it the innovation economy re- uh, revolution, where everything is going to change and it's much, happening much faster than on the industrial revolutions before. So what is so fundamentally different with blockchain technology? It really solves the problem that the internet had from the beginning on. It, tra- it solves the problem of transferring value between Internet users without having to rely on a third party. So instead of just sending messages from A to B or copying files, it really creates unique digital value in the Internet. This creates complete economic models that were impossible before of the emergence of uh, the most popular distributed ledger blockchain technology, the Bitcoin ledger. It really creates what we think is called a complete new set of economics. We can call it crypto economics, where value and collaboration over the internet can happen 
outside of the traditional financial institutions and creates a completely new model of how that collaboration is going to happen. Again, when you start to look into blockchain technology, you look, you, you look at Bitcoin, of course, very clearly in cryptocurrency. But one of the things that becomes very clear the deeper you dig that the usage scenarios for blockchain technology go far beyond just the financial values itself. Really, any kind of transaction of information exchange could potentially benefit or at least be in touch by blockchain technology over the next years. And it will be a radical transformation. We, and every time we have a revolution or dramatic change, a lot of things we thought it's fixed and will never change will change and will happen faster than we can imagine. So it's important for all of us to understand it's not the strongest of the species that survive, nor the most intelligent, but the ones that are most responsive to change. We have seen it over and over again in our research. We looked at it, uh, my first book called Agility, Competing and Winning in a Tech Savvy Marketplace made it very clear. Those organizations that are adopting technology capabilities as fast as are usually the ones that are winning in their environment. We today have over 7 billion people in the world. Only three and a half of a toothbrush, but nearly all of them have now access to a cell phone. We have over six billion cell phones, okay, some of them have two. And it has tremendously transformed the access of information globally to the electronic exchanges and communication channels around the world. Having said that, only 20% of humans currently have access to the banking system. It's a system that was developed in the Renaissance age, and it really hasn't really changed that much with trusted um, clearing houses in the middle and very, very high transaction costs, at least much, much higher than the poor of the world could afford, or that even be making economic sense for microtransactions that we will see more and more in the sharing economy, for example, on the IoT world. People and investors see this. We have seen a tremendous amount of increase of global fintech investments over the last few years, from $2.4 billion investments to $19 billion of investments into the fintech industry, and it's just over three years. And the trend is definitely not going to slow down of what I'm seeing in the investment community here. It's really going to change, and the leaders um, and thought leader uh, of uh, the industries that will be most affected see this today. I think fintech is clearly um, transforming large organizations. Um, I think uh, this Anthony Jenkins from Barclays said it, it's the banking industry's Uber moment, or the hotel industry's Airbnb moment, maybe. It's really going to change, but it's not only changing how the companies do business, it's actually changing what kind of people will make business decisions going forward. It's really the IT leaders or the people that have a clear understanding of what technology can do that are going to be much more prominent in leadership positions outside of the traditional IT field, but they can be in marketing, sales, organizational structure. You'll see them more and more climbing up the organizational ladders there. There are some key areas for fintech where we will see blockchain technology, of course. There is the whole remittances, lending, insurances, mortgages, investments, and peer-to-peer -peer environments where blockchain technology startups um, are playing a role right now, where, of course, you said not all of these startups here are in the blockchain technology today, but a lot of them are looking at these areas. As uh, Tufi mentioned earlier, I'm working a lot with companies in China, um, in the, the, the Shanghai, which is one of those new districts in Shenzhen, um, directly focusing on fintech and fin uh, the financial industry for sure. Um, Alibaba, Tencent, um, they are all on uh, very, very strongly focusing here. Of course, every time you're talking about money and new technologies, there is risk involved because one thing is never changing. When there ever is value or money, some people trying to steal it and get their hands of it. Over generations, we have been clear that security is important. So protection has always been key for anything of value. So one of the things we'll talk about in, block, in the blockchain technology discussion is protection of, um, of our assets. As money evolves, 
so do the threats. So we have to be very conscious about it and looking at all the different models that are out there and in discussion right now and thinking how do they hold up to security, um, to security concerns. Before we dive into the details of the blockchain technology, I want to be very clear and making sure we're not talking only about Bitcoin. Bitcoin, of course, is the best known usage of blockchain technology. It's around for nearly 10 years. And it really changed the game how people were thinking and adopting the new technology. Again, I believe it's, uh, it's a very, very strong play out there um, with Bitcoin. But I think it's like in the early times of the internet, it's only the tip of the iceberg. I think we will see far more usage beyond the digital currency itself. So let's start with, um, let's start a little bit more, what does it actually do? Because it really removes an inefficiency in a system. And I believe that in every system, inefficiencies will be removed sooner or later by technology. And those efficiencies will go back to either the consumers or the owners of uh, capital. We have seen this over the last 40 years very, very dramatically in the industry. We will see new business models coming up. The sharing economy, Uber, Didi, Airbnb, have already shown over the last five years how startups coming out of nowhere with a new model can transform complete existing industries that haven't changed for 100 plus years. We will see peer-to-peer -peer financing, the Lending Club, Kiva, bridging gaps organizations internationally that have been thought to be undividable before and connecting people directly and making an impact. So what does the blockchain actually do? When I'm in the front of the room of uh, people that are really not have a technology background, I usually try to explain to them, if you take a picture on your digital camera, you can share it with your friend, your neighbors, your colleagues, as many times as you want. All of them can then continue to share that picture again and again and again. None of these people sharing the picture are losing anything. So the digital copy is as good as the original. Nobody loses value by sharing this digital asset of the picture. Completely different if I'm attaching the information to a blockchain. In that moment, instead of copying a digital file, I'm creating a unique digital asset. I'm transferring not only the picture, but I'm tra actually transferring the access right to do anything with this picture. So in that moment, I do not have access to it anymore. I lose value. We can argue if this particular picture is worth half a cent or five dollars, but it has a unique value now because I am giving up access to this one particular digital asset. And like a picture, like a coin, I can really attach anything to um, any digital asset to a blockchain. The blockchain settlement process is very different than what we are used from traditional financial transactions. In the past, we have clearing houses, we have central exchanges, aka banks or central banks, that are managing the transfer of value from one organization or individual to another. In the blockchain process, we have true peer-to-peer -peer networking. The value is transferred peer to peer, and then it's validated by the blockchain itself, by the network of the blockchain itself. Blockchain itself is ultimately about collaboration. Emerging technologies like blockchain will be a game changer if we all we work together. If communities come together and work together. There's a lot of discussions about incentive models, how to make this happen, and uh, we might even have some time during the Q and A to get more into detail there. But it is a collective effort, and the broader the collective is, the more opportunities, and I think the more democracy we will see in the blockchain environment as well. Let's talk a little bit more about the technical side. As we have seen development of networking from the centralized old school computing, but also from a business perspective, where we have top-down organizational structures, we have moved technology-wise and business and organizational-wise 
to distributed decentralized and eventually peer-to-peer -peer networking as well as organizational structures and business uh, relationships. It really changed computing and businesses over the last 20 years dramatically. Peer-to-peer -peer networking today is everywhere. When we started to talk about the technology in the late 90s and were concerned about Napster and file sharing, nobody thought about um, IP communication with Skype, for example. Well, looking at um, tools like uh, WeChat in China that have taken over within two, three years nearly the complete population and changed the process of how people exchange value, communicate, collaborate, and uh, change really the banking system. There's no need for credit cards in China if you have a mobile phone with WeChat or Alipay. All of these things are coming together and accelerating with each other and making completely new scenarios possible. Now, thinking about commercial and government services, they're basically databases that are centrally owned and managed. A central database has a lot of advantages from a scalability perspective, from a security perspective, and a control perspective. But it also has a single point of failure where people can do malicious actions, where things can go wrong. The transactions in a database are recorded in a ledger. And again, that principle hasn't really changed since the 1600s. What happened with uh, the blockchain is we are moving from a central control and central point of failure to a much more, sorry, to a much more distributed environment where instead of one point of failure, we'll have thousands and millions of nodes talking to each other, working with each other, and being fault resistant to a degree that has been impossible to predict before. Again, it's the same story as with the internet. Instead of having a central control, many, many um, distributed environments allow the survival of the internet even in a catastrophic failure scenario. Blockchain technology really allows to create distributed ledger versus a centrally managed ledger across international and organizational boundaries. One of the key things that have made Bitcoin and the Bitcoin blockchain so special is the high focus on the immutability, which means a record that has been written once on the blockchain can never be changed. Um, it creates a token for every transaction and so without a, for every block and without the uh, token that would be just a regular database. But utilizing um, cryptography, in this way, creating the blockchain technology, you will be, um, organizations will be independent and create this new environment. So the benefits of a blockchain secure distributed ledger versus a central ledger, I mentioned some of them. One of them, information can be put in a blockchain, can never be changed. You could now create worldwide ledgers, not only organizationally or local ledgers, for intellectual property, for land titles, for art, all of these things can now be created and managed across, again, countries, boundaries. There will be full, in the Bitcoin blo uh, blockchain, we will have full transparency for every transaction. So it's very clear who transacts with whom, um, what's the value of a specific good, and um, have it been paid for. And every information is recorded forever, so we can go back and make sure it hasn't been tampered with, and we have a complete track of ownership if it has been recorded on the blockchain. That's why countries, for example, like Estonia, are thinking intensively of using blockchain technology to making sure that in case their central systems get hacked and occupied, they will have an opportunity to go back and making sure that uh, they can prove which records actually have been tampered with on the central base um, through having a backup on the blockchain. So let's talk a little bit more about classifications. The blockchain technology itself is a peer-to-peer -peer network secured by cryptography and proof of work. So that's the foundation here. Um, I think blockchains can be divided in generally in three different groups right now. They are public and open blockchains, they are private blockchains, and then they're government created or fostered or controlled blockchains. Examples of those. Some of the um, public blockchains would be, for example, of course, Bitcoin, I mentioned this earlier. 
And um, they're working with an incentive model where the miners are receiving a crypto, are getting paid in a cryptocurrency called Bitcoin. Similar with Ethereum that is focusing more about a, trying to create a smart contract platform going beyond just the value exchange. Where, but uh, Ether here is the motivation for, um, for, for the people participating in the network. There are different altcoins like Litecoin, Dogecoin. And then we're going to go over and, and myriad more. It feels like every week there's a new one. Um, and then we're starting to look into um, private use of blockchain technology. There are consortiums like R3 that is usually mostly driven by U.S. banks. Uh, Microsoft is part of them. Um, we will have um, we have organizations like uh, Citibank who's creating the City Coin. We have, of course, Goldman Sachs who is trying intensively to go into that area. I'll hopefully, touch on that a little bit longer. I, um, and then we have companies like Disney with Dragon Chain, and I'll touch base on that as an example uh, a couple of minutes from now in more detail. And last but not least, we have governments. I mentioned uh, Estonia looking into blockchain technology and very, very intensively um, the Chinese government and their leading, uh, the leading uh, the efforts by the People's Bank of China are driving intensive development, not only of cryptocurrency, but also how the technology of blockchain can help beyond the currency exchange and the micropayments, but really looking at how it transforms trade and collaboration in international collaboration scenarios. So one of the things that we're going to see is blockchain really allows new players to offer completely new services to their existing customers. As I said earlier, inefficiencies will be removed sooner or later. In the traditional transaction business that is managing 20% of the people right now, we have 1.7 trillion business uh, uh, dollars in inefficiencies based on the economist study from 2013 is up for grabs. Those are opportunities for either existing players or startups to completely revolutionize transactions. And it's not only the banking system. It really goes, as I said earlier, far beyond it. Records of estates, records of shares, financial transaction, even in the voting in the democratic process could be benefiting from blockchain technology. The whole area of uh, IP management, but also messaging central trust, um, relevant for a lot of IoT applications, could be benefiting from blockchain technologies. It's not that difficult today to use the technology. There are tools like IPAU, which makes it very simple to actually transfer Bitcoin back into the real world and buy a coffee at Starbucks or a gift card at Amazon. Um, it's happening all around us. We're not sure which one will win, but there are definitely a lot of usage scenarios that make on-ramp and also much easier. You probably heard the news that going forward, Bitcoin can be used in Japan for a lot of more um, payment environments there as well. So let's talk a little bit more about Disney. I mentioned them earlier. The global organization with lots of different business units. They need to think about secure IT and their logistic needs. They need to think about how to pay from the park in Paris, the owners of specific IP logos, characters um, based in California. Do they use the traditional, traditional banking system or do they use internal transfers? Well, they're currently there is no alternative, there was no alternative. So what they did is they created their own blockchain transfer mechanism for internal organizational transfers between organizations, film studios, and suppliers. What they will do, what they do also is they use the same technology, they call it Dragon Chain, to track with IoT the whole supply chain that goes to their cruise ships. You will be able to make sure where the salad is coming from that ended up on the, somewhere on a ship on the Caribbean. They're really tracking the end-to-end -end logistic chain using the chain, the logistic chain, tracking uh, using the blockchain technology. Um, it creates completely new models. So, for example, you can start to trade as a visitor to a theme park. You place in line with other visitors, creating basically 
a marketplace within the Disney environment for the users, things that were not possible before. Disney has developed it, but they don't want to own it. They decided to make it an open source project, make it available online. Um, if you go to dragonchain.org, you can find some more information. And really trying to leverage the community and open source different blockchains to manage and empower and grow their own application there. We'll see more and more organizations, I think, trying similar approaches. Let's talk a little bit more about governments. These are some of the organizations uh, I've been working with and they're intensively working on the blockchain environment today. Um, a little bit over a year ago, um, we were at the APEC conference in Peru and uh, talking with government leaders about FinTech future, but especially about blockchain technology beyond FinTech and how it can create organizational, environment, uh, organizational um, disruption. Um, countries like China, South Korea, Singapore were all, no, I think South Korea, South Korea, were all on top of it. They're very, very intensive in those discussions already. They're collaborating with each other, but also competing strongly as they see the opportunities. There's a competitive factor for their own economies. Um, I'm based here in Seattle, so working with the governor of the state of Washington and his team, we are trying very intensively to making sure that Seattle is not only the cloud capital of the world, the cloud computing capital of the world, but we are focusing very intensively on fostering technologies like IoT and, of course, now the blockchain technology. And last but not least, China. Um, you might know that over 80% of all Bitcoin mining today is already happening in China. Um, the leading manufacturer of chips for Bitcoin, um, Bitmain, is based out of Beijing. So there's a lot of effort that happened uh, that was built first around Bitcoin, but then around the technology itself uh, over there um, on the other side of the Pacific. We'll see the government um, is fostering at least three or four cryptocurrency projects right now um, that are going to very likely change how business is done. One of the conversations we always have to keep in mind is what about regulations and restrictions? From an economist point of view, every restriction comes with a cost. It's just a question who is carrying the cost. And that's a, that was a pet peeve discussion we can talk online. But every time we make um, a restriction and regulation, it comes with a cost to, some, to somebody. And we just have to make sure as a society we're clear on what it means and if we're willing to have that group pay that particular cost. So let's have that as a conversation and be, while we are thinking about how we use the technology. Again, China, as I mentioned earlier, um, is investing heavily. Shenzhen, uh, the small little village 35 years ago on the other side of Hong Kong that is now, I think, at least a 12 million people um, city, is creating a completely new development zone called Shanghai um, that is about a 20-minute boat ride from the Hong Kong airport faster to get there than to Hong Kong downtown, um, that is focusing on the digital currency experimentation zone, the financial zone. Um, you have all the key players that are in that area from Tencent, Huawei, um, again, the People Bank of China, really focusing on collaborating and creating the next version of the digital environment. And if you have not been uh, aware of it yet, now it's a good start to, to really see what's happening on the other side of the Pacific there, how much focus is happening on innovation there. Because all of these governments and organizations understood, I think, that there is eventually, Milton Freeman is eventually right, there will be a digital value system beyond the nation state. Um, the central banks are very concerned about it as soon as they start to understand it. And it's go the question is only, how is it going to happen? Is it going to be an open source environment? Is it going to be a government controlled environment? Is it going to be one of those existing systems that are emerging like Bitcoin or Ethereum? Is it maybe Goldman Sachs that is investing heavily into the blockchain technology already or, any, or some other altcoin or technology that is just emerging right now? We don't know, but I think we will see more and more happening over the next years. As I said earlier, if we have, what about security? If you think about distributed ledgers and blockchain, 
we have unparalleled opportunities. I think I talked about those hopefully before, uh, enough to get you all excited. Uh, but we also see paradigm shifts and risks that are happening, risks to technology, to the business, society, and government. All of those we really need to understand, drill down, and decide what it actually means. Um, cyber currency and cyber technology go hand in hand as the internet evolves. So what we need is a clear vocabulary and model to have those conversations. The one model I really like um, is developed by uh, William Morgan and uh, looks at six different levels of security levels um, that we need to consider as a blockchain in the blockchain environment. Um, it looks at first the transaction labels. Are transaction valid with certainty? Then it looks at the actual accounts that people own. How easy are they to protect and or to break in to manipulate? As we go up the value chain and looking beyond just pure cryptocurrency, like the Ethereum blockchain that is focusing on smart contracts, we see that programming becomes a challenge. How are those programs run? How are they controlled? Um, how are they validated? Assuming we can even fix that, uh, we've, we fix that level, we have to look at the distributed organizations itself the network, and last but not least, the governance, how our decisions are made. Let's drill down a little bit deeper for this audience in each of those steps of security. First on the transaction level itself. The minimum here for any well-functioning blockchain, it needs to validate transaction with certainty and predictability at the end of the consensus cycle. It is really important that a transaction final, is final and immutable. That's one of the big advantages we have with Bitcoin versus traditional transactions. Many people don't know that if you, do a, if, you, if you accept a credit card today, until you actually have the money on your account is about 90 days. That's the time it can take for people to dispute a transaction, for banks to validate it, and so on. So you're not really sure if you have a specific amount on your account for 90 days if you accept a credit card as a merge. Different if you use a blockchain or a Bitcoin transaction. The moment the transaction is finalized, right now let's say it can take about 10 minutes, you have final proof and final evidence that your transaction is yours. You own it now and it's immutable. It cannot be reversed. The trust in a blockchain environment that this transaction is immutable is critical. Bitcoin today has made this one of their cornerstones. It comes though, again, with the cost of how many transactions can be handled, what's the cost of a transaction, and how can this be utilized for, um, for other markets, environment, and business scenarios where the um, transaction speed needs to be even higher than that, and the transaction cost might need to be high, uh, lower than that. The second level, though, I think overall on the transaction level, we have now a pretty good proof model, again, with Bitcoin, how this could happen. The second level, then, is the actual account level. Where is my account? Is it on my cell phone? Is it on my PC? Is it in the cloud? Is it, by, is it provided by a service provider? Where is my actual account? Like my bank account that is owned uh, by a bank um, that are managing the ledger for me. How much do I trust that entity that is owning my account? We have seen more and more hacks in that environment. If you think one of the big, um, the big challenges with Bitcoin upfront was really not with the technology itself, the underlying blockchain technology, but it was hacking into those account management providers. They did not make their accounts safe enough. Um, one of the large, I think last year, 2016 um, breaks in Hong Kong, what happened because the actual accounts were hosted on a private server in somebody's dorm who then left the computer for a couple of days unsupervised and somebody broke in into the physical hardware and stole the money that was saved there. 
that is definitely not enterprise level or banking level security of a data center. So we really need to understand what's happening on the account level there as well. Now, assuming we'll figure out the account level, what about programming? I mentioned, I touched very briefly earlier, like Ethereum is focusing on smart contracts. What does a smart contract mean? It means we are, we are creating a business deal that if something specific happens, a payment, for example, is triggered. And it's a computer program that is written, we agree on what it is. Let's say I want to boost my Google search ranking and I hire somebody and said, if you're in three weeks, you're getting this point, you're getting to go to, you're receiving two Bitcoins. And if you don't fulfill, you only get 0.25% Bitcoins. It's a very clear measurement, very clear date. This is all written in a smart contract. And then two weeks later, we can decide, uh, uh, the computer automatically decides what the gold hit or not. And then the amount of payment is released and or not released, or the appropriate amount of release is released. It's a simple computer program. But with all computer programs, vulnerability is a key challenge. What we've learned on the Ethereum um, K, uh, blockchain over the law in 2016 was the uh, DAO lesson. It was really where we had a very exciting pilot, an alpha version of people joining, a, creating an investment fund based on consensus on uh, smart contracts based on the Ethereum blockchain. But hackers exploited that particular program. Again, it was not hacking the actual blockchain, but it was hacking the program that was using the blockchain, defrauding um, thousands of investors um, and an equivalent of millions of dollars. So the Ethereum community, which is uh, managed by um, a nonprofit based on this, based in Switzerland, um, decided to go back and compromise one of the key concepts of a blockchain, the immutability, to restore virtually all the lost funds. That was good for the people that are defrauded, but it was a very painful process for the community, and it really had a strong impact on the trust of uh, the, broader, the broader environment on the Ethereum blockchain, because the moment immutability is gone, what do you really have left? And we saw this, the value of Ethereum as a currency dropped dramatically, um, until about a couple, I think about a month ago when it started to crawl up again. So we have some real, real challenges there. Um, but on the other hand, those are great learning opportunities. And as we said, we are at the early stages of blockchain technology. Lots of learning is going to happen. So assuming we have the program 11 to 6 2, we're focusing about the distributorization level. We talked about what is behind it, who is organizing it. Um, autonomy has its risk, but how do we make sure that in a distributed organization, bad players do not take over the actual system? There are different, so different philosophies, different community approaches. Bitcoin, Ethereum is, is uh, definitely good case studies there. But I think we will see some more and more technology approaches that are looking at um, mitigating the challenges you have in a distributed organization. Um, how much hashing power, computing power does it take to take it over? But are there other smarter, potentially, ways to, um, to deal with the security issues in a distributed organization? Then we have, of course, network challenges. As the blockchain is a physically, virtually a peer-to-peer -peer network, the challenges of networking become really, really critical. A network that runs on consensus methods um, works well if you have only good players. But how many bad players can such a system actually tolerate and still function? Um, in the Bitcoin environment, in Satoshi's paper, 
we're basically saying as long as 51% uh, of uh, the hashing power, the computer power in the block, Bitcoin blockchain are good players, um, they will outperform and uh, keep the system secure. Theoretically, an attacker can spend enough money and hash power to hijack the specific transaction and validate it and change the block going backwards. But in that process, they would destroy the trust into that environment and all the investment that has been done before. So the rest of the system is very, very motivated to prevent that from happening. If you're going a little deeper, um, you might actually find that the number potentially could be closer to 30-something percent. Um, less, less chances, but um, less probability. But um, it is definitely a very real issue. Now, if you go to smaller blockchains that are built on the same principle like the Bitcoin blockchain, the amount of hashing power needed is much lower there. So they are much, at least in theory, much more likely to be hacked and or taken over by a bad player. And last but not least, we have to think about the governance level. How do we actually manage a blockchain? How do we drive it? For, how do we make sure it stays intact? We have different approaches today that we can observe. We have Bitcoin, which has no central entity, but a lot of discussion group of very passionate people um, discussing key challenges like performance, costs at this block, block size at this point in time. And it is a very slow process. On the other hand, we have Ethereum, also open source with clear leadership, um, a nonprofit organization that is discussing and driving things. We have the private blockchains, we have uh, new approaches coming up left and right. So I think we will see all of these um, developing. We will have discussion about decentralized consensus. Um, how do we manage it? How do you manage it efficiently? What are the key things that cannot be changed? Well, how do we all think about immutability? Um, it's, an interesting it's an interesting to observe what's happening and how strategic decisions are taken for the specific blockchain. And I think we will learn a lot over the next five years um, that will then influence the success of blockchains going forward. How real is blockchain technology? I mentioned earlier Goldman Sachs publicly acknowledged and invested $500 million just in the research of the technology itself. Um, you might know that they bought uh, the, uh, the Consumer Bank of GE's. So instead of having $10,000 minimum, you need to have $1 now to be a uh, Goldman Sachs customer. And I could see them building their own blockchain and financial transaction mechanism independent from central banks going forward. Um, Microsoft has declared blockchain as one of the key must-win workloads for the Azure platform and business, so they're investing heavily there. Um, I mentioned earlier the R3 group of U.S. banks. They're using it now for bunch trading in pilots. Um, it was the hottest topic, I think, at uh, the Financial Innovation Forum 2017. Um, that was when the CEOs plus one of uh, the top financial institutions of the U.S. came together for 26 hours to hang out and discuss what the future of the industry is going to look like. So the people you usually know from TV, from Wells Fargo, Visa, Mastercard, um, and blockchain was on the top uh, on the top of the agenda. There, both from the presentations with uh, Jenny from IBM and Satya from Microsoft, but also in the in the smaller discussion groups uh, where I was participating and discussing the future of fintech and, and blockchain there with them. So it's really on top of people's mind. And I think we will see a lot of movement in 2017, 2018, and 19, even in the with the traditional players around the technology. As I said earlier, governments are investing into their local blockchain and see if they can create a competitive advantage. What is holding it back today? It still is difficult to understand. It's difficult to use. It's not that easy to buy into the different uh, blockchain cryptocurrencies at this point. There's a perception of risk. There's the media that this is illegal and there's Bitcoin. This is all for the shady business. On the other hand, I think there's a study that 20% of UK pounds, uh, the cash money is actually used for illegal trading anyway. So anywhere where you have money, challenges are arising. And I think that should not be discouraging us from looking at the alternative race. <clears throat> but I think the key one we'll see is for the individual, for the broad masses. While they've understood what email can do for them and Facebook, they do not understand what blockchain technology and cryptocurrency can do for them and how it makes their life easier right now. Where that is happening, adoptions happen quickly, 
And again, I can highly encourage you to look at what WeChat and Tencent did in the last couple of years by completely changing how an economy is paying and trading um, by making it easy and integrated into their social experience. I think we will see in 2017 and beyond um, that blockchain is going to revolutionize the world economy. Um, we will create a completely different trust models of peer-to-peer -peer mass collaboration, creating new economic models over the next five years, um, where sophisticated computer code, rather than central powerful institutions, will take over, make the world more efficient, and enable these new scenarios. We will see changing transactions and finance and businesses, international collaboration, and the government's tool chests that are going to be used to enable scenarios like the, um, the transport to the new, as called the, the new Silk Road, Road and Belt from China all the way to Europe, where customs, IoT challenges, bribery reduction are potentially managed based on blockchain, techno based on blockchain technologies. I believe that agile organizations will create completely new ways of collaboration and transactions. And I think all of us need to keep looking at what's happening on the other side of the Pacific because there's so much happening with it in China right now on the innovation side, uh, especially around this blockchain technology that uh, we need to make sure we're aware of what's happening. I think it's the revolution. It's there, but it's also an opportunity for all of us. It doesn't matter where we are today. It will be a fundamental change of business, technology, processes, structures, and people. And those of us that are participating, that are on top of it, that are unlocking the potential for the people around us and the organizations we work for, they will be the ones that are rising and being able to drive that transformation. And our technology and customer-oriented leaders are positioned to drive and realize the vision and image of the future. I think it's those two together, customer orientation, and an understanding of what technology can do to, for them and on their behalf that will separate the successes from the not so successful approaches. With that, it's now up to you. Make it happen. I think we have a great community on the call today. Be the ambassadors, explore what the technology can do for you and follow us uh, on, the, on this journey. Uh, educate us, learn with us, um, share what you're seeing. With that, thank you very, very much for giving me the opportunity this morning um, here to have this conversation with you. I'm excited to continue the conversation on the different forms of social media, and I think we're going to take some questions. Tufi, please take it away for now. Cool. Um, thanks so much, uh, Mark. We have a lot of amazing questions, uh, precisely 106, uh, and we ha only have seven minutes remaining, so chances are we won't be able to cover all of those questions given the blockchain inefficiency. Um, no pun intended. So, <laughs> um, a lot of uh, the questions that I'm, uh, I try to aggregate some of them here, and uh, we will have, uh, uh, you know, a link uh, to, to show some of those answers later on. Um, the first question here I would like to put in, uh, somebody's asking, they would be interested in learning more about the incentive adoption models that you mentioned. Okay. So I think it's, it's a pretty broad topic that will take us far beyond the seven minutes we have right now. But I think there's different philosophies right now about uh, in, so for blockchains to work, computing power needs to be made available in a network. On one mm -hmm. side, there are people that believe there needs to be incentives for um, that network to be provided, for example, the Bitcoin blockchain. But I would assume that even the inventors of the Bitcoin originally did not envision the industrial data center mining, uh, mining data centers that have been built in China, in, uh, in Iceland, and here actually in the state of Washington to drive Bitcoin mining itself as a completely new industry. Um, on the other hand, we have models like, say, Bit, uh, BitTorrent, where people voluntarily without any compensation, share files. Um, I think we, the jury is out which one is going to be the winning capacity, uh, the, the winning model. They, for the time being, I think we will see them um, working in parallel. And um, the amount of computing power required, I think, will be one of the key factors 
that we're going that are going to be um, driving if dedicated mining management is necessary, or for example, if we can come up with a solution that creates that requires only a very very small part of uh, computing power from every mobile phone um, to make that specifically specific blockchain viable and working for the broad masses. Great. Thanks, Mark. Um, another question that uh, seems to manifest itself in so many different forms here, uh, one is mentioning the 1.7 trillion in inefficiencies. Uh, some folks, they thought it's 2.7, 2.5 trillion and whatnot. We all know it's a lot of inefficiencies in existing uh, financial transactions and whatnot. Um, and now, um, somebody asked an interesting question. Is that what are the hard costs of blockchain can you give specific examples? And I think the individual here is asking for existing blockchain, uh, although we do know that uh, in the, in the future of blockchain doesn't necessarily describe how the current uh, state of the blockchain, the way I view it, the current state of blockchain is more like FTP, and this is not the HTTP. When we see the HTTP coming, then you can see the web revolution have bigger, you know, penetration globally. Uh, but currently, the, the question here is like, what are the hard costs of a blockchain? Can you give specific examples? So, um, if you just Google, I think, you're hacking power for uh, Bitcoin or for Ethereum mining, you can actually find uh, up-to-date statistics what it costs you right now from a computing power to create, to be participating in those systems. On the other hand, I think I mentioned I said earlier, there are completely different approaches um, of how other blockchains could work. And I think, uh, Tufi, you mentioned earlier the, the TODA A protoc uh, protocol that you and your co uh, teams have developed. That's a very different approach for using very small amount of computing power um, to make actual a blockchain work. Um, another example, I think, if you want to search for it, and I think you mentioned it earlier as well, is uh, Algorand. Um, Professor Mikali from, uh, from uh, pr Cambridge provided a very detailed picture there of how a shared blockchain could work, um, especially when people volunteering their computing power there. So I think there is no clear answer um, across all blockchains. For the leading ones, it's very it's really just a quick Google search, and if you can't find it, I'll post a couple of uh, links later on. Cool. Thanks, Mark, and thanks for the shout out there on the Toda protocol and. Uh, I'll go around uh, with Professor Michali. A um, lot of great things coming ahead. Uh, I feel that a, about a year ago, we, we all were struggling and looking into how is this blockchain going to scale. It's extremely costly and so on and so forth, and it's creating like a new incentive for miners, and which is leakage and so on and so forth. But I think the future is much brighter than what we see today. Um, now, uh, another question here around the security and uh, there's so many of them. I'm just going to ask one of them. Couldn't the blockchain be changed by spreading a virus among the systems implementing the blockchain? In effect, it can be considered, you know, to be a network system, you know, to, to, to be compromised as a whole? Well, theoretically, is it possible? Absolutely. Like, every, every, everything, is possible. everything is possible. I think if you look at the Bitcoin blockchain, um, it's running for 10 years without um, such an incident at this point um, on the chain itself. Um, and again, I think you have to understand the players that are working in the system itself have a vital interest to protect their investment. So that's one of the areas we talk about incentives to prevent that from happening. So they have to, because it's open source, they have an ability to actually look at the code and verify it and see what's happening. Um, and that's why some of the change is happening so slowly because people have to really trust of what's happening there. With, again, and slow change has an impact on the efficiency of the system itself. So I don't think there's clear on, could it happen? Yes. Um, is it happening in, in is, did it happen in the, in the Bitcoin blockchain so far? It's not as far as I know. Um, but I think, um, again, that comes back to the incentive and governance model. Um, how do you actually make sure that that particular blockchain, how is it managed and supervised? Excellent. Thanks so much, Mark. We're running out of time here. Uh, we have a lot of amazing questions, but uh, don't forget that the discussion continues on, uh, on our discourse page, uh, you know, which opened in your tab earlier. If you don't see it, uh, you can access it now through the link in the resources window. 
I'd like to thank uh, Mark Muller Eberstein again for his information and informative uh, uh, presentation and insightful answers to the many questions. A special thanks to each of you for taking the time to attend and participate today. This webinar was recorded and will be available online in a few days at webinar.acm.org. Uh, you can find announcements on upcoming webinars and other ACM activities at learning.acm.org and acm.org. Also, please fill out our quick survey where you can suggest or speakers which you should see on our screen in a moment. On behalf of ACM, Mark Muller Eberstein and myself, Tufi Saliba, thanks again for joining us and I hope you will join us again in the future.